cancer industry specifically. It has changed dramatically. The field of biophotonics was just getting started. The first instrument that I bought was a microwave spectrum analyzer. It's time to shed light on our universe. This is All Things Photonics, a podcast about the physical science of light. Join us as we explore the latest in lasers, optics, spectroscopy, and microscopy. Each episode, you'll hear from leading voices from across the photonics landscape. We're brought to you by Photonics Media. This is Associate Editor Joel Williams. Here are this week's top stories. Researchers from King Abdullah University of Science and Technology have developed a laser-based device capable of sensing extremely low concentrations of benzene. The system ultimately allowed scientists to detect benzene concentrations that were three orders of magnitude lower than in a conventional sensor. Collaborating researchers from the University of Copenhagen's Niels Bohr Institute and the University of Bochum have developed a chip with scale-up potential that they say will serve as a core component of a quantum simulator. The researchers demonstrated an ability to produce a large enough number of stable photons encoded with information to scale up their nanochip device. A novel plant nanobionic optical sensor capable of both detecting and in real time monitoring levels of arsenic in underground environments exhibits changes in fluorescence intensity to indicate the presence and quantity of the metal. Scientists from the Disruptive and Sustainable Technologies for Agricultural Precision, an interdisciplinary research group at the Singapore-MIT Alliance for Research and Technology, MIT's research enterprise in Singapore, introduced the technology. An international research team led by the University of Minnesota Twin Cities has produced a quantum state that is part light and part matter. The researchers achieved ultra-strong coupling between infrared light and matter by trapping light in tiny annular holes in a thin layer of gold. The holes were as small as 2 nanometers, or 25,000 times smaller than the width of a human hair. The research has implications for the next generation of quantum-based optical and electronic devices, and may also contribute to increasing the efficiency of nanoscale chemical reactions. And finally, a team of physicists in China have demonstrated a quantum advantage, introducing a light-driven quantum computer capable of performing a computation that would take a classic supercomputer an estimated 600 million years to resolve. The team's photonic quantum computer performed the boson sampling problem, a computation problem originally devised in 2011, in a matter of minutes. Up next, news editor Jake Saltzman speaks with Chun Lei Guo from the High Intensity Femtosecond Laser Laboratory in the University of Rochester Institute of Optics. I'm Joel Williams, and you're listening to All Things Photonics. Join us in January for the inaugural Photonic Spectra Conference. Four days of online presentations spanning lasers, spectroscopy, optics, and biomedical imaging. 60 presenters all in one place, focusing on the latest in applications, trends, and advancements. Registration is free. January 19th through the 22nd, right here with Photonics Media. Visit photonics.com slash PSC info for event details. We're joined today by Dr. Chen Lei Guo. Dr. Guo is a professor in the Institute of Optics at University of Rochester and operates the GPL Photonics Laboratory. His research in femtosecond laser matter interactions at high intensities and in other areas has produced discoveries of a range of highly functionalized surfaces, notably black and colored metals, and superhydrophilic and superhydrophobic surfaces, which we will talk about momentarily. He is an elected fellow of the American Physical Society. Optical Society of America, and the International Academy of Photonics and Laser Engineering. Welcome, Dr. Guo. Oh, thank you for having me here. I want to begin with with a question that sets us up for a bit of an expanded discussion. Much of your work involves lasers and metal. Seems simple enough, although it's become highly sophisticated thanks to you. When did this interest emerge and where does it come from? Well, yeah, that's a very interesting question. I will start to say Interesting enough, I actually was not trained as a material scientist in grad school. Instead, I studied atomic physics for my PhD. 
So when I first built up my research program at University of Rochester, I was very interested in studying fundamental laser matter interactions. I meant very fundamental at almost, you know, at the atomic physics level, given to my background. So I chose metals because they are very simple, and that's how you can really get into studying the fundamental aspects. And my motivation at the time was certainly not about technologies, because, you know, if you wanted to study high-tech, advanced technologies, and people naturally choose some more advanced and exotic materials, and that's typically not associated with metals. So technological-wise, at the time, if you think about metals for using a femtosecond laser, you we were talking about you study micro-machining. So people were studying, you know, how to make more precision cuts in metals and those type of things. So perhaps I entered the field from a, a very different background. I was looking at the problem through a different lens. And then at the time, I was very interested in studying all these fundamental things. For example, exact, you know, how much heat and energy will be deposited into a metal following a femtosecond pulse ablation. You know, well, interesting enough, you know, those fundamental research activity actually paved the path for us to gain a deeper understanding of laser metal interactions. And following that, the researchers took a very sharp turn from the fundamental research to technologies and applications. I hope, you know, in some way, we help the metals become relevant again in high tech. As you mentioned earlier, you know, some of the applications we did, we developed was black metal, color metal, and hydrophilic, hydrophobic. I'm sure we'll discuss in more details later on. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That is the plan. Uh, and since you mentioned it, hydrophilic and hydrophobic, they're two opposite qualities. Can you tell us a little bit about that contrast and the, the unique benefits of each characteristic? So, um, Initially, we were working on the optical properties, and then we asked the question, could we uh, modify the metal surface and their wetting properties following the surface structuring so that we can change the way they interact with water? So in the next few years, after we developed the black and color metals, we were focused on developing a range of technologies. So one is the superhydrophilic effect, the other one is superhydrophobic effect. So a superhydrophilic surface will attract water. So if I were able to demonstrate this here, if I were to put a piece of treated surface, uh, stand vertically, and then I put a drop of water at the bottom of the treated surface, the water will actually define gravity and sprint uphill against the gravity at a at a rather high velocity, thus shows how strong this super hydrophilic and super weakening effect is. So we are talking about a few centimeter per second, that's the velocity the water will run uphill. You can certainly imagine some applications coming from this, including if you have the water spread across the surface very quickly, and we can imagine, you know, if we use the coolant, this can take the heat away. So that will be the cooling effect. And then you can do some micro fluidic study, micro all this fluidic research. You can enable it in a much smaller and much more efficient level. So on the other end, a hydrophobic surface. So there's some inspiration from the nature. We know lotus leaves, they have a, a strong hydrophobic effect. Well, that comes from the lotus leaves, and they have both structures and also some chemical wax on it. What we did was we do not need to use any uh, chemicals on the surface, purely by laser texturing the surface, creating the range of nano and micro scale structures. We were able to uh, make the surface super hydrophobic. They are extremely strong. Also, we are talking about the surface will repel water with such a vigor, and the water drop, it will just roll off the surface. So superhydrophobic surface will be very important for applications such as, you know, anti-corrosion, anti-icing, anti-, -icing, anti 
filing sanitation, and that's actually lead us quite a bit other technologies. Right, and you talk about some of these applications, and it's not one or two, it's, it's many, and they're diverse. And some of those applications really pertain to societal issues, talking about clean water accessibility, both in terms of uh, desalination and solar applications. Can you talk a little bit about what it means to you as a developer of some of these technologies to be able to apply the research to these really important applications around the world? Right. So uh, once we have these superhydrophilic and superhydrophobic surfaces, in recent years, we have been really focusing on trying to apply these surface properties for applications in societal issues, energy and environments, such as a superhydrophobic surface will enable self-cleaning, sanitation, and then we can use the super-weakened surface to uh, wick the water out of a, a dirty pond and then have it evaporate under the sunlight, and then we can achieve water purification without even any additional energy besides the sunlight. So this is really the research, um, the shifting basically from this, as I mentioned earlier, the overall shifting of my research from very fundamental to the applied research is really across wide spectrum. When we're talking about applied research, we can think about you can make a detector or you can make a sensor. Those are applied research. But working on this societal issues is certainly challenging. It's another level of applications for a research lab. So from my personal experience, I think I certainly felt fortunate I could have this range of research experience across the full spectrum, all the way from very fundamental atomic physics level fundamental research, all the way to this far-reaching problem solving. And well, as a scientist, the fundamental research is very comforting. On the other hand, I think it's a is certainly a daunting task to solve this societal issue. It's a much harder task, but I think it's important and it's gave me tremendous fulfillment to work on this problem. We're talking with Dr. Chen Lei Guo from the Institute of Optics at University of Rochester. And it isn't just our podcast who has noticed the, the impact of your work. Funding has come in from, from entities like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and others uh, who have put their trust in your work what does that mean to you? I, I have to think it's quite profound. So the investment, the, the funding from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was to support us to use our, initially use our superhydrophobic surfaces for uh, global sanitation. So the mission was we can apply the technology to build a toilet with very little maintenance and with very little water flushing. You can imagine in uh, developing worlds, water is a very scarce resource, and you certainly don't want it to. Uh, they may not simply have that access for clean water. On the other hand, sanitation is very important. In that project, we were working on building a clean toilet, and then with little water, with little maintenance, and then more recently we were working on so we can turn dirty water and to uh, purify it, and then you can turn it into the drinkable water. This is, I think, is probably more relevant today than ever across the world. And uh, think about today during the COVID period, everybody will say you have to wash your hands as often as possible. But think about across the world, in many of the developing countries, they are lacking even the clean water to drink. So this funding really allow us to put our efforts and to put our technology into this uh, societal and humanitarian problem solving. I was really a profound experience. I think as a scientist, we like to associate our work to a uh, you know, most of the events and most high-tech applications, but the motivation behind this work is on the opposite side. We want to enable our technology to really benefit as many people as possible. And for me, to give me a, a definitely a great amount of fulfillment to work on this issue. I suppose this question is really relevant to, to those in any discipline. 
given the times and the nature of the times that we're in. But you speak of COVID-19 and the state of the world and the importance of resource conservation, preservation, and access to resources. Has that really emerged as a theme in your work lately? Lately, yes. We are trying to uh, put in our efforts behind this energy, environmental, sanitation, this type of research. You know, looking at a couple of most recent research activities, uh, one is we utilize the super weaking and super black surface. We combine this and then we make this enable a water purification. I sort of touched upon a little bit early on and that can uh, just automatically uh, basically evaporate the water and collect the clean water and that's water purification. And another work also recently developed in the lab was we were enable the so-called thermal electric generation and utilizing our black mat. And we also make the metal surface become more efficient in just absorb the solar spectrum and minimize the heat loss. And in this way, we can enable quite a bit of study to uh, harness the renewable energy so that we can power we can utilize it for our everyday life. Talking about the black metal broadband absorbers, these applications live on, but in fact, it was 2005, 2006 that your lab created its very first black metal broadband absorber. And that, of course, has been fundamental to much of the research since. Can you uh, just tell us what a black metal absorber is and how you first created it? You know, if you think of uh, metals, they are very shiny. Basically, shiny metals reflect light into your eye, and it looks very shiny. When we uh, use the laser to process metal surface, so essentially we make it super absorptive. That's why it's pure black. The light will not get reflected into your eye. You, it just appears very black. So what we did was we used the laser to uh, texture the surface and created a range of tiny nano microstructures. And these structures essentially are responsible to absorb all light, fall upon it, and nothing really get reflected. The black metal will be very useful whenever light collection is needed, such as making better thermal sensors, thermal detectors, and you know the black metal will also enable some of the application I just mentioned, absorbing the solar energy and convert it into electricity and then also utilize the thermal energy and help us for water sanitation. It's really help us overall research in, uh, in utilizing the black metal, uh, enable a lot of energy environmental problem solving. You mentioned the, the use of femtosecond laser pulses and, and pairing that with metal. One of the efforts that that work contributed to was your ability to make regular incandescent light bulbs super efficient. Can you walk us through that process a little bit? That was about 10 years ago. Yeah, right after we developed it, we developed the black metal technology. At the time, that was the time the government was passing a law to face the incandescent lamp. And uh, it's really the period. I think it's a very, uh, I would say, a very difficult period for us to see this technology really uh, light in the world for over 100 years and just start to uh, vanish from our lives. And at the time when we had this black metal technology, so there's the one uh, fundamental law in physics, the Kirchhoff law. The Kirchhoff law says, the more absorptive a material is and more emissive it is as well. So there are actually many reasons why a incandescent lamp has a low efficiency. But one fundamental issue is the people had not really looked into at the time was the tungsten filament is not really a good light emitter because it's, it's metal, it's, it's highly reflective as mentioned, it doesn't absorb much light, and therefore it doesn't emit light as well. So we were at the time, because we had this uh, black metal technology, we thought, why don't we just apply this onto the tungsten filament and turn it black to enhance the emission efficiency? That's what we did. So we passed the laser beam actually uh, through the through the above envelope and then directly blacken the area onto the tungsten filament. 
and afterwards we screw the light bulb back into the socket and turn it back on and lo and behold it glows brighter and you just really make it brighter it's so interesting you talk about kirchhoff's law that hasn't gone away right. tungsten filaments have not gone away and incandescent light bulbs though they've been diminished greatly in their use haven't gone away and yet this brilliant work involves an application that has not gone by the wayside, but been drastically cut down. How does that influence the legacy of the work? After this work, I was very touched um, by by very strong public outcry at the time. So right after our discovery, the New York Times ran an article featuring our work. And then afterwards, I received countless messages from people from all walks of life and sharing their emotion, their sadness of losing this incandescent light bulb. And in some way, we have to understand, if we talk about the illumination sources, we have to think a little bit carefully. Now, during human evolution, in the distant ancient time, the ancestors will use fire to lit up at night. And then later on, people had candles, and then more recent history, we had incandescent light. If you think about the three sources, fire, candles, and incandescent bulbs, they are all heat-based sources. And therefore, I suspect that as a human being, we are adapted to heat-based light sources. So all of a sudden, when we were pushed in a very short time period, push into a different non-heat-based light sources, I think it's not surprising many people have problems just from the human adaptation point of view. And therefore, a lot of people share their personal stories with me. And I remember there was a person said his wife really had serious health issue when she was sitting underneath a fluorescent light bulb. I think the flickering gave her a lot of health problems. So I, I heard a lot of those issues. I hope, you know, the technology today for fluorescence and LED really improve. And we definitely wanted to uh, minimize those type of issues early on. But I think afterwards, well, interesting enough, about a month after the first New York Times article came out, I received another phone call from the same reporter, and she told me she wanted to run the second article because the public opinion was just so strong. She she needed to run another article. So um, days later, a second article came out in the front page of the business section of the New York Times. I think overall, the technology, from the fundamental research point of view, we put down, we lay down a, a piece of work that really, I hope, will help people later on to understand this problem. How do we drastically change the materials, the metals' emissivity, and so that we can increase the efficiency? Again, from the society, from the human point of view, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, share my research with many, many people that gave me a tremendous amount of you know, fulfillment for a research activity in the lab. Even in this conversation, we've, we've touched on already quite a few different topics. We've gone from more of an atomic angle to black and metals of different colors to water and resource conservation. And one of the constants is something that we're well-versed in uh, here at Photonics Media, and that's the laser. And we've celebrated the laser's 60th anniversary here in 2020. And with regards to the laser, what are some of the areas you believe we've come the farthest? Certainly you, uh, your, your opinion, given your, the volume of your work, is one we all value. So today, looking at the, the laser market, I think we have a very strong laser market, and lasers enter many, many areas of our everyday lives. And people use laser pointers, supermarkets use lasers to scan barcodes, and manufacturers use laser for a range of machining applications. So all these developments have gone quite far, I think. But on the other hand, we have a long way to go for the energy and environmental issues. This is not just related to laser. I think overall, our society today is commonly believed we are facing really uh, urgent problems for our our energy usage, our all the environmental issues. And this 
these problems is just across the board are quite urgent and have a lot of work to do. And for using laser in this type of problems, I think it's still in its infancy. We haven't gone too far at all. And I touch upon some of the work we uh, we did in this area, and certainly that's one of the reasons we really wanted to put our efforts behind this the endeavor, and hopefully we can uh, contribute our research activity to a broader global energy environmental issues. We still have a long way to go. These are always somewhat unfair questions, sort of in the vein of, if I knew the answer, I'd be working on it. But I want to ask you, what are some of the specific areas where you hope to see expanded progress, either with the laser or with other technologies? I do believe the energy environmental things is quite urgent, just like I mentioned. I would like really to see today we can collect our efforts and put in more activities in these areas. And expanded applications are, are something certainly we continue to see. Again, I'll, I'll use lasers as an example. With regular usage in, in medical science and extreme environments and, and many more, you can't work with all of them, certainly not at the same time. What are some of the areas and the applications that most excite you? Today, we certainly put in quite a bit of effort in sanitation. That's one area. And as we have touched upon early on, one thing is we have to we have to think about a huge amount of global population still like access to clean water. That's one major issue. And because of this, I believe the number is about one million children will die because the poor sanitation and the sanitation related diseases in mostly the developing countries. We we really can uh, put our technologies in this part of the use first. That's why we put our efforts behind pushing our technology, building, for instance, a toilet, and so that we can deploy to the developing countries. And also, you know, early on, I touched upon lacking the clean water, not only for drinking, but also for cleaning, washing hands, you know, showering, and this has become more and more important today. And we have to really thinking about there are a large amount of a large percentage of population they are lacking clean water, lacking clean drinking water, lacking the clean water for for washing hands and those type of things. And that's why we put our technology behind this endeavor as well, so that we can uh, use the technology highly, highly efficiently and just use the surface and the sunlight and we can evaporate purified water, very dirty water, into a drinkable water. So the research, the recent research we demonstrated, we put all types of contaminants into this uh, contaminated water, including heavy metals, you know, dye, and, you know, human waste, all these different type of contaminants. And then it turns out every single test the contamination will way below the environmental standard and they can be uh, drinkable right away after the collection. We've been speaking with Dr. Chen Li Guo from the Institute of Optics at the University of Rochester where he is a full professor. And one of the things that's emerged in your work, in applications involving your work, in this conversation even, is that things don't always happen in a straight line. Rarely do they happen in a straight line. It isn't linear. And speaking from experience, what advice do you have now for, for young scientists who are either working with femtosecond lasers or committed to making a difference through their work? Uh, you've been able to do that now, so I want to get some thoughts on what your, your advice might be for how to best use capabilities and performance for young scientists. Right. I would say follow your passion. As I shared slightly earlier about my own experience, I, I actually studied atomic physics for my PhD. And at the time, I hadn't done really metals and hadn't done much material research. And But I think they have potential to make some difference. So once we were working on this problem, when I started to work on, on the metals, and at the beginning, uh, there was resistance. Um, at that time, I remember when I first developed the black metal technology, I was talking to some people. They were very surprised and even uh, suspect about the results. And because they 
at the time, he couldn't imagine a shiny piece of metal would become pitch black. And I certainly received my share of, you know, doubts and even criticism. And but I think if you truly believe your work and truly follow your passion, you will make a difference. In my case, I hope we make some difference to the uh, today for the understanding of how dramatically we can change the metal property and how much application we can uh, bring forward with this altered metallic properties. One final question for you, and I suppose it's a logical ending question, is, is what's next in your lab? We are continuously wanting to push the technological envelope based on our background technology, the black metal, color metal, hydrophilic, hydrophobic. I think the applications are endless and as I sort of mentioned, <laughs> mentioned early on for the incandescent light bulb, and I received a lot of inquiries and a lot of messages from people from all walks of life. And I certainly receive the same share of messages, the same share of inquiries, and people turn to us for help for other technology as well. And for instance, hydrophilic, hydrophobia applications. And I would say I, I wouldn't have time, you know, enough time to answer all those emails, even read through all those emails. And certainly we didn't have enough time. We haven't enough time to, um, to work on these problems, but there's a huge amount of work uh, left to be done. Certainly I would like to have my lab to continue to make a push and to advance some of these technologies further. Dr. Chen Lei Guo is a full professor in the Institute of Optics at the University of Rochester and operates the GPL Photonics Laboratory. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you, Jake. LaserTech, the Center for Laser and Fiber Optic Education, was founded by the National Science Foundation in 2013 to help meet the goals of educating and sourcing domestic talent in optics and photonics. You can read about LaserTech in the 35-member LaserTech College Network each month in Photonic Spectrum Magazine. The Resource Center currently works with students of all ages nationwide to grow and support a workforce in optics and photonics. Joining us now is Chris Penayotu, Executive Director and Principal Investigator of LaserTech. Chris, good morning. Uh, what are some of the trends that you are observing um, in industry and academia that are shaping the current opportunities uh, that you see as available to rising professionals in optics, photonics, and laser-based fields? Good morning, Jake, and uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be on your show. We appreciate that. Going to your question, the laser industry is going through something similar to what the electronics industry went through when it transitioned from vacuum tubes to solid state devices back in the uh, previous century. Uh, so lasers are transitioning from the big massive and complicated gas and solid state resonator type of uh, lasers to fiber and semiconductor lasers that are smaller, more efficient and less complicated. No mirrors to align and clean, no gases and uh, pressures to worry about. So speaking for technicians, which is uh, the focus of laser tech, uh, the technicians that we graduate need to have a broader skill set, especially in automation and networking. And as more of these devices are connected remotely uh, through the internet and uh, local area networks. Also, for low power lasers, we have uh, now tunable lasers that allow us to create any wavelength uh, at will, something very similar to what happened back in the uh, previous century when uh, the phase log loop was introduced, allowing us to synthesize frequencies at will. Something that is very active and fervently occurring right now is work in quantum photonics. I see a lot of applications coming up quickly Right now, uh, there is a lot of talk about cryptography, biomedicine, uh, animal and plant biology. And as time goes on, more applications will develop, creating exponential growth in technology in this uh, specific branch of photonics. 
Uh, more inventions and applications of lasers are demonstrated every day in human and biological systems. Without sunlight, there is no human and plant life. With our ability to synthesize light of any wavelength, control its intensity and direction, many unimaginable applications are being developed that can be used in human and plant biological processes in a positive and gainful way. The application of lasers in material processing will continue with lasers becoming more efficient, smaller in size, and less expensive. Uh, I see also many applications in spectroscopy, especially a large growth in Raman spectroscopy, which allows detection and identification of substances without the need to extract the sample. So these are some of the the major thrusts that I see happening in the area of uh, photonics and laser-based fields. Laser Tech was founded in 2013. In those seven plus years, how have you seen the number of those opportunities that you just mentioned? And I suppose also the the number of different types of opportunities uh, for qualified, uh, educated professionals ready to enter the workforce. How have those numbers evolved since Laser Tech's formation? Well, the number of opportunities for technicians are increasing as new photonics technology are increasingly implemented uh, in more products. Uh, we have graduates that are working with companies own, owning drones that are loaded with LiDAR imaging systems and optics, welding companies utilizing lasers for welding and brazing, medical uh, and biotechnology equipment manufacturers using lasers and optics in their systems. Uh, we also see a lot of uh, demand in utilities, such as electric power plants, fresh and water uh, treatment plants, which are using fiber lasers to connect uh, sensors present in noisy electrical environments. They're using spectrometers to identify and measure different substances in their processes and, and many more applications. Now, since 2013, Laser Tech at that time I had only 16 college uh, members and we were producing about 380 technicians every year. Today, in 2020, we have 37 college members and we collectively uh, graduate approximately, approximately 750 technicians annually. However, the gap between the industry need and the number of technicians produced uh, has widened because of the new jobs which have been created over these years because of the innovation and because also of the massive retirements of baby boomers, which started in around 2012 when the uh, economy you know, started to be shaping uh, up and uh, people decided to take uh, re to retirement. So... The gap is, is, uh, is still there, and the, the, the need is great. The type of technician industry needs is also changing. As fiber lasers and laser diodes are replacing older laser systems, technicians um, with more electronics and robotic automation skills are needed. Today's technicians are expected to have a wider skill set in many areas of technology, compared to the technicians of the 20th century who uh, had a, a more in-depth but a narrower uh, skill set. What's fascinating is that not only are, are the number of technologies and the range of technologies growing, of course, with that comes the, the growth of the skills that you just mentioned that recent graduates and, and new technicians are expected to have. So I want to take that uh, and move it to the through a lens of the recruiter of industry and, and ask you, with regards to recruiting, what should members of industry, uh, workforce and leaders know about laser tech colleges and their students uh, about how they should find or seek out qualified members of the workforce? Well, uh, laser tech has recognized the need very early, very early, uh, and to increase the number of photonics technicians, we must increase the number of students entering uh, our programs. So we created a plan for a pipeline that will enable students from uh, K-12 uh, schools to continue to community colleges uh, to obtain their associate in science degree. We created and offered uh, dozens of professional development seminars 
workshops and courses for middle and high school teachers. We created and offered the lectures, demonstrations, workshops, science fairs, science celebrations, and field trips for high school and middle school students, and created all kinds of opportunities for the general awareness of community with talks like on detected the, the first gravitational waves for the International Day of Light and the laser celebrations and things like that, which are open to parents, students, and, and grandparents. So with, with all of these efforts, we try to increase the number of uh, people coming in. Uh, on the other end, we have our graduates we want to present to industry uh, to fill these jobs uh, that are available. So in that area, we're very grateful to have been working with Photonic Spectra for this year, since January 2020, on a special uh, column that we have on your magazine, on the print and the online version, where we feature a college every month, a different college every month. So in that uh, process, we have featured, as of today, 11 colleges. We have one more to go for this year, and then we will continue in 2021. And we have uh, talked to these colleges, which are members of LaserTech, and they have committed to provide to industry all the uh, facilities and all the conveniences that they need to enable them to interview and recruit students from their campuses. So they have all committed to provide a, a day or two for industry to visit their campuses. They will make the students available for them to uh, talk to them about their businesses and their opportunities and make available special rooms for industry recruiters to uh, have interviews with students and fill their openings. Uh, we, we have been doing this for, with several colleges uh, for years, and most of the time, our students are being offered two or three uh, different job opportunities by January time before they graduate in uh, May or, or uh, June timeframe. So we have been doing this for some time and we are expanding this to all the uh, colleges which are members of LaserTech and those are available or can be found spread out throughout the country in about 2027 of the 50 states we have uh, college members as of today. Chris Paniotu joins us from Fort Pierce, Florida. He is executive director and principal investigator of LaserTech. Chris, thank you for being on with us. Thank you very much. I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity. That does it for this episode of All Things Photonics. Thank you to our engineer, Alan Shepard, and to Joel Williams with the news. Our featured music is courtesy of betterwithmusic.com. Most of all, thank you, our listeners. As always, you can share your thoughts, pick us ideas, and let us know how we're doing. You can reach us at all things at photonics.com. All Things Photonics is available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, as well as on our website. Subscribe, never miss an episode. I'm Jake Saltzman. This has been a Photonics Media Production.